process of uh, sorting that out as we go, but we're making good progress. I'm probably about three quarters of the way through organizing each session. Um, today we're in the Covenants. This will be part two of the Covenants. Last week, just as a review, we went through the four major covenants of the Old Testament. Um, and the goal is really trying to understand um, the future. We have to look at what was actually promised. I think that the Lord is very serious about um, a future that, that He has a very specific future in mind. And when He made the covenants and He made the promises, um, He gave us very specific details about that future. Um, I think he wants us to know what it looks like. And so, um, part of this class uh, that we haven't really gotten to yet is, hey, let's look at all the in-between, all the exciting stuff uh, between the promises and the ultimate fulfillment of the promises, right? Um, that would be things like the time of Jacob's trouble, uh, the Antichrist, um, and this, this coming counterfeit kingdom of Satan. Um, but then comes the end, right? Jesus returns... Uh, he establishes a kingdom and, and all begins to become right with the world once again. Um, so what we're looking at right now is the very beginning, the promise is made, and then we're going to transition and start looking at what does this real specific picture of the future look like, um, just to get a good foundation for the rest of the things that we're going to be talking about. Um, like I said in our first session, a great way to um, really get off track is to just go to all that interesting stuff in the middle before Jesus returns um, without any real foundation of what was promised or any real distinct picture of what it's supposed to look like at the end based on those promises. And then you can just kind of go any direction you want with it. And a lot of great cults have been started in that fashion. Um, and like I said, both within orthodoxy and, and outside of orthodoxy. So um, we're going to go back and we're going to kind of review those covenants real quickly, but the point um, that we're going to make in this first part is that these covenants have not been totally or completely or finally fulfilled yet. Um, we talked about in the first session how prophecy uh, written from the, the Jewish perspective is, is often fulfilled in stages. Um, sometimes there's hints of fulfillment, um, but the idea is that the... Uh, marker that I have um, you know, if we're, if we're looking at a cup, um, you know, it's, in our, in our Western way of thinking, you know, like, we make a prophecy, and we're going to fulfill the prophecy in total, all at once, and we're going to fill this cup up, but in the Jewish way of writing, and, and kind of the genius of God, is that there's so many different layers to a prophecy being fulfilled, and so, um, you know, the initial prophecy is going to have some fulfillment in the immediate future of the prophet that's speaking. Um, there might be some messianic overtones for the time of Christ in his first appearance and, and maybe the cross, but ultimately this prophecy doesn't get filled up until the return of Jesus um, when he finally and completely fulfills these prophecies. And so when we're looking at the covenants, um, We'll try to demonstrate that. Um, and like I said, these are, this is a theme and a pattern that's consistent throughout the Bible that you can, you can count on. And those are the things that we're looking for to establish um, uh, good foundations. So the land. Um, the land was outlined very specifically. It was promised to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and to their descendants. It says that they would in inherit that land forever. And so... Something about that promise tells you, well, how is Abraham going to inherit this land forever? He's immortal. He's going to die. You know? So um, that's kind of the, the first clue to that promise that, wow, this is, this is a grand promise, uh, of maybe a little bigger in scope than um, he initially thought. Because remember, they tend to use hyperbole. That's exaggerated language in their culture, right? Um, I find more and more that... Uh, People may think Jesus or the Lord was using hyperbole with some of the language of these promises, um, but in the end we're going to see that now he's actually pretty serious about what he was promising. So, um, the reality is, is that Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, uh, they never actually physically owned that land. 
It didn't belong to them at any point. They sojourned in that land, uh, but they never owned it. And then they died. And so then you are going, well, did God not fulfill his promise? Did he fail? Right? These are the questions that have been asked over the ages. Their offspring, the nation of Israel, the promised people, were also promised the land as an eternal possession in safety and security. So they have never owned all of the actual land promise as outlined, and um, they've rarely dwelt in safety over the centuries. Jesus, the ultimate heir of the promise, the real heir of all that land, the rightful owner, um, he actually never owned any land in his lifetime, right? And so this is a this is this land promise is still hanging out there. Now, one of the things about these covenants is that um, you know the Israelites have lived in the land, right? There are Jews living in part of the promised land today. Um, and so I think that there has been a lot of human attempt to fulfill the promises of this covenant, right, in our own efforts. Um, but it's always in a way that is temporal and not permanent and, and, and can never really satisfy the fulfillment of the covenant in the way that it was intended. Only Jesus can do that. And so the other side of that coin is that... Um, there's a controversy over this land, isn't there? There's a controversy over the Jewish people, isn't there? Um, strange that there just seems to be like this supernatural hatred of the Jewish people all around the world. And that's absolutely fueled by the devil himself. Um, and the land. I mean, if you, look at, if you look at the history of the promised land, especially just even in the last hundred years, um, the controversy over that little piece of property on the planet um, is incredible. Um, and so I think that there's a very real aspect that Satan is doing everything that he possibly can to prevent this covenant from coming to fruition, which should tell you that um, if Satan's taking it seriously, then maybe everybody else should as well, right? Um, and so there is very much a real conflict ahead over the Abrahamic covenant, specifically those people in that land. Um, and that is the theme that was established all the way back in Genesis, and it's going to be played out all the way at the end of the book of Revelation. And so it's very pertinent. Um, so the second part of that promise was the actual nation of Israel, that they would be righteous, that there would be righteous descendants from Abraham. And while it is true that Israel experienced revival at times, they have never been a completely righteous nation. In fact, uh, the overwhelming majority of her existence has been in rebellion, resulting in exile and oppression from the surrounding nations. Now, there was a heyday of the kingdom, right? If you remember back to when David was on the throne, uh, and, and especially Solomon, and building the temple, the first temple, um, Israel seemed to have expanded its borders, um, wealth was flowing in from the nations, and they were at peace with a lot of the surrounding um, nations for a time. Um, but it still wasn't a complete fulfillment, um, especially in the, in the forever, eternal aspect of that covenant. And remember that the other patriarchs are gone. They didn't get to enjoy this time. And so um, there are some... There are a couple spots in the Bible where it may seem like, um, oh, this covenant's been fulfilled, um, but we're going to see from the New Testament perspective really explicitly that, no, this, this has not been fulfilled. Um, so, righteous descendants, that was the promise. And so you see this is one of the reasons that Satan is so bent on inflicting um, death and persecution onto the Jewish people throughout the ages. Uh, and as we'll discuss as in more next week, um, that's not just outside the church, but it's also been inside the church as well. Um, so, I mean, the, the terrible irony of that is that Jesus is very people, the, the people that he is the king of the Jews, um, being persecuted by Christians who claim to follow that, that same king. Um, but we're going to talk about how theologically we got there as a church next week, and um, these resources are really aimed at 
and exposing that history and exposing the, the anti-Semitic theology behind it um, to bring us to a place where we can really come into maturity as the church and understand our calling and our relationship to the nation of Israel, both believers and unbelievers. The third part of the covenant is that um, it calls for all the families of the earth being blessed, right? And so we're, what we find out is that um, we're talking about Jesus wants a remnant, a representative of all people groups in the kingdom. And so salvation has been spreading throughout all the families of the earth, but there are currently thousands of unreached people groups that have never heard the name of Jesus still. And our missionaries out in the world are translating the Bible, they're learning languages, they're trying to get into these tribal cultures. Um, and it's not even third world nations, but it's, it's uh, the 1040 window, all the Muslim nations um, throughout the Middle East and the East that um, are very violent and resistant to the gospel. Um, there's people groups in those nations that still have not heard the gospel. And so we see that um, salvation has not yet come to all the families of the earth. They have not been blessed by Abraham's ultimate descendant, Jesus. And then we get to the throne of David. Jesus, the seed of Eve, remember that was the original promise was to her, uh, the seed of Abraham, the seed of David, he has been revealed as the king of Israel and the rest of the world. However, he never took the throne, right? And presently, his throne lies in ruins somewhere beneath the Dome of the Rock, which is a Muslim mosque that sits on the site of the original temple that Solomon built. So if you go to Israel today, or you look at pictures of the Temple Mount area where the temple once stood, um, you'll see that that Temple Mount area is completely dominated by Islam. There's two mosques actually sitting on top of that Temple Mount. Jews have very restricted access only at specific times, and pretty much any time they go up there for any reason, um, especially if they pray, um, a riot breaks out, and it's it's ugly, It's and it's constant. And so, um, again, we see, uh, this, is, this is Isaac and Ishmael, this story is as old as that. This is Islam and, and, and Judaism um, clashing over a piece of land, a tiny little piece of property that seems to be the center of the earth. Because that little piece of property is the specific piece that Jesus claimed for himself where he's going to establish his throne. And again, Satan absolutely wants nothing to do with that, because when Jesus established his throne, Satan gets his head crushed. And the last promise that we're looking at in the covenant, I refer to as sinless immortality. This comes out of the new covenant. Um, and so, those who have placed their faith in Jesus currently have received that down payment of our inheritance in the Holy Spirit. He said he put a new heart in us and a new spirit in us and caused us to obey him and walk in his statutes. But the problem is, is that we're still subject to sin and death. Even if we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we can still go against the Spirit. We can still choose sin. Even though we've been um, crucified with Christ and, and, and we're a new creation in Christ and all of these things, the, the physical reality is that this body still has to die. Um, and we're still subject to corruption. A big part of what the New Covenant is promising is, is the resurrection itself. Is on the other side of the resurrection, or if you're still living in the return of Jesus, the translation of the believer into the glorified state, um, what you end up with is an immortal who no longer has the ability to sin like we do now, and so we're no, more, we're no longer subject to sin and corruption. And so this is really the vision of the kingdom. This is really the vision of the promises, is a kingdom filled with people who are perfectly righteous. Um, and so in the meantime, we've kind of got a taste of it with the Spirit, and, and, we're, and we're united with Jesus. But there's going to be a very physical, tangible reality someday where um, we don't sin anymore and we do live forever, and this kingdom just rolls on. So... Uh, just to bring it into Hebrews 11, it says, These all died in faith, re referring to the patriarchs, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. 
That was verse 13. And jumping down to the end of the chapter 11, it says, And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. This is really important. Um, I get kind of excited about this because what we're seeing here is that um, God's promises to the patriarchs remain unfulfilled because it has always been in God's heart to join his people together across time before fulfilling all that he has promised. This means that the hope of the resurrection, which is so central to the New Testament, uh, was always part of God's plan to fulfill his plans. So this, imagine this. This covenant that the these promises that we're benefiting from thousands and thousands of years later that were made to Abraham, when Abraham is resurrected and we're resurrected or glorified as well, we get to come into those promises together with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. This, this whole thing comes to this giant crescendo at the end, um, and we get to be there. We, we're going to witness this, which is, which is amazing. Um, and so we look at the covenants fulfilled at the return of Jesus. Now, this kind of gets into Romans 11 a little bit. If you're not familiar with Romans 11, um, I'll, I'll just kind of recap it a little bit. There's a huge scandal in the New Testament, okay? And the scandal is, is that um, Paul's going around preaching um, the arrival of the Jewish Messiah and, and proclaiming to the Jews and Gentiles to put their faith in this Jewish Messiah. But everybody's pointing at the elephant in the room, and, and the elephant in the room is, well, the Jewish people didn't even accept him, why should we, right? That's the big question that's hanging out there. Yeah, we read about thousands of people coming to faith in Jesus at Pentecost and these things, but we're talking about thousands among millions. The Christians were still the... the a very underwhelming minority, a sect within Judaism as a whole. And so, um, yeah, and, and it's a valid question, right? So Paul addresses the question and he says, hey, there's a mystery out there. See, this is how the Jews thought this was going to go, including the apostles. The idea was that the, the Messiah was going to arrive. He was going to establish his kingdom. Israel was going to become a righteous nation, and they were going to be this beacon and this light to the nations that they were supposed to. That's always been promised, right? They're supposed to be a light to the Gentiles. And so when you look at like the, the Pharisaical movement of the first century, we read about the Pharisees. They were trying to make the nation of Israel righteous. They were super serious about following the law, right? And we kind of knock them because of their self-righteousness. But the whole point of them trying to police everybody's righteousness and the law and, and acting the way that they did was because they thought that if they could get Israel to turn it around and be righteous on their own, it would cause the Messiah to come. And then it would get the Romans off their back. And they were looking at things from a very temporal perspective, right? Um, and so then if the Messiah comes, then he establishes his kingdom. Israel is freed of the Romans. They're, they're you know, in their rightful place. And then eventually what happens is the nations benefit from this, right? Well, the, what actually ended up happening, and what Paul tells us, is that um, quite the opposite. Um, the, Israel rejects the Messiah, which is what causes the gospel to go out to the nations. And so Paul is out there amongst the nations preaching the gospel to Gentiles in order to make the Jews jealous for their own Messiah so that hopefully they'll be saved. And so what he says is, hey, here's the deal. The Jews rejected Jesus largely, but granted, there's, there's still a remnant. He's one of them. He's, he's example A. But that was so that the gospel could go to the nations, which was part of the Great Commission, right? He said, go to Jerusalem, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, right? Well, Jesus lets us in on a little secret. He says that once the gospel reaches the ends of the earth, and this is out of Matthew 24, 14, when the gospel of the kingdom... Um, must reach all nations, all peoples, right? Then the end will come. And so Paul puts this together and he says, okay, I get it. They reject it. It goes to the nations. Once all of the nations, once there's a remnant of believers from all the nations, then Israel will come to 
finally believe in their Messiah and Jesus returns. And so um, all of the elements are there, just a little bit out of order. It was a, a mystery. And so when we're looking at um, Israel and the nations and salvation, we realize that in these covenants, <coughs> everything is deeply, deeply intertwined. You can't have one aspect without the other. And so the hope of salvation for Jew and Gentile depends on the complete fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. The Gentiles cannot be saved unless Israel becomes that righteous nation and permanently inherits the land forever. Israel cannot be saved until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, all the families of the earth being blessed. And neither can be saved until their one king, Jesus, returns to take his rightful place on the throne of David forever. And at that time, the new covenant will be fulfilled when Jew and Gentile are glorified in the resurrection, never to sin or die again. So all the elements of the Abrahamic, the Davidic, and the new covenants will finally and completely be fulfilled together, um, almost simultaneously, at least in that same era. Okay? And uh, Abraham will receive what was promised to him at the same time that we will, which is when Jesus returns from heaven, resurrects everyone who has died in faith. And probably the most famous passage would be out of 1 Thessalonians 4. Alright, so this class about eschatology um, is quickly becoming a class about salvation, right? Um, we figured out that you know these great promises um, result in uh, a kingdom and, and a kingdom being filled with, with righteous people. So um, what I want to do is I want to kind of run back through a couple examples of salvation in the Old Testament, because this is a, a really important question for next week. But um, the idea is, or the question is, were people in the Old Testament saved in the same way that those of us living in the New Testament on this side of the cross are saved? Um, Paul goes to great length to argue that Abraham was saved before circumcision, and therefore he um, was you know, father of both Jews and Gentiles. I want to take it back even a step further. I want to start with Eve. I think that um, there is very um, plain and, and, and real um, reason to believe that Eve was actually the first believer in all of the Bible. Um, and, and let's look at let's look at that. So if you have your Bibles, you can reference. Uh, we're going to start in Genesis three. So Eve. Um, he believed in the promise, okay? Uh, the Lord, who's standing there talking to her and the serpent and Adam, uh, he makes, he, he's speaking to the serpent. But remember, he says, I'll put enmity between you and one, between your seed and her seed. You'll bruise his heel, but he will crush your head. And this is essentially a promise. This is a prophecy made by the Lord himself, right? And when we see the Lord walking around and talking, um, we understand that to be the Lord Jesus uh, prior to his incarnation. And we kind of touched on that in the last couple of weeks. I'll keep touching on that because if it's a difficult concept to grasp, it was really difficult for everybody in the first century too, right? Um, they, they could totally understand that this guy's a man. They had a hard time wrapping their mind around the fact that he was the God that they interacted with in the Old Testament. So here we have Jesus, the promiser, um, promising Eve that she would have an offspring that would crush the serpent's head. He's going to rectify the situation. And that offspring, who is the promised one, right, who's going to crush the serpent's head, is actually Jesus himself. And so we have the promiser and the promised one, um, both, both standing there in her presence, right? And that's why Adam called her the mother of all living. Um, all who believe are Eve's offspring, including Abraham. And I say that because um, Adam called her the mother of all living prior to her, her having any children, right? Eve does, hasn't had a child at this point. So what is, what is this living that he's talking about? And I think that um, Eve means life. And I think this is really the salvation of Eve. It's got, it's got overtones of, of life in it, and there's life in her. Um, so even though they ate of the fruit, and in that day they will certainly die, um, life has been restored to Eve um, because she believes she's been justified in the promise. And so when we jump to Genesis 4, 
um, we we start out in verse one, um, and then we see Eve calling on the name of the Lord when Cain is born, and. Uh, I got some issue with some of the translations of this verse out there, so I'm going to give you my translation, okay? Uh, she says, I have gotten a man. Cain's name sounds similar to the word gotten, and so she named him Cain, right? And the next verse, she says, I have gotten a man, and even the coming one. Now, a lot of your translations will say, with the help of the Lord. Um, with the help of is not in the Hebrew. This is, I, I don't know why the translators just couldn't leave it alone and, and take it for what it was. But the Lord, as you remember, means the coming one, okay? Yahweh. This is the Lord's covenant name. It means the coming one. And so what she's saying is, I've gotten a man, even the coming one, okay? She believed the Lord when he said, you're going to have an offspring that is going to crush Satan's head. She has an offspring, and she confesses, the Lord has given me, this, this is the promised one, right? The coming one. This is my this is my seed, right? Um, even the coming one, and so in a in effect, we see the Lord's name kind of in the narrative as as Moses writes this. But this is the first person speaking in the narrative to speak the name Yahweh um, over this child, because she probably believed that this was the promise. He certainly is. Uh, you know, he, she thinks that he's the promised one, right? Satan, I would argue, probably believed he was the promised one as well, which is why he tempted him to kill his brother Abel, and then they have a third child named Seth. If you read at the very end of chapter 4 in Genesis, you'll see Seth has a son, and it, there's, a, there's an important phrase right at the end of the chapter. It says that, and at that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord, Yahweh, the coming one. And so what we're seeing is, is that people are expressing faith in the promiser, right, being justified by faith, by the one who made, because they believe the person that made the promise, who is Jesus, and they're looking ahead to the promised one, the seed, and they believe that promise, and that is, that is where salvation is going to come from, because that promised one is going to save them, and he also happens to be the same person, right? So, I'll let you, I'll let that soak in, you can reread that this week, and, and kind of look at those chapters, and um, it, you want me to re-explain that at any time, I'd be happy to look at it in greater detail with you. Um, but we're going to move on to our next example, which is Abraham. And I would say Abraham is one of Eve's offspring in the, in the spiritual sense, um, because he expressed faith like Eve. Abraham believed Jesus, the promised her, and he counted it, counted it to him as righteousness. So in Genesis 15, this is where it's explicitly stated, and Paul quotes this in Romans, um, the Lord... The word says, the word of the Lord comes to Abraham. He takes him outside. The Lord and Abraham walk outside together, out of the tent, into the desert, in the middle of the night. He says, look up at the stars. And if you can count the stars, then you can count your descendants. This is the promise that Jesus is making to Abraham. Remember, Abraham hasn't had any children at this point. Sarah is still, Sarai is still barren. He's still Abram. Um, in that... It says, Abraham believed the Lord, and the Lord counted it to him as righteousness, right? Paul quotes this. Well, who is the promiser? The promiser is Jesus. He led him outside and, and is having this conversation with him face to face. Who is the promised one? Who is the ultimate descendant? It's, it's Jesus, right? And so when we're looking at the salvation and the faith of Abraham, he believed the promiser, and that's very explicit, he believed in the promiser, um, but he also believed in the promised one, to come, and so those are um, two sides of the same coin. Interesting. When so, let's look at the Pharisees for a second. Okay, they certainly thought that they believed in God, right? Um, they certainly thought that they believed in the same promises that they believed in Abraham. They thought they believed in the same promiser. The problem is, is that when the promised one showed up and was in their midst, they rejected him, and. And you think, well, they believed God, but they just didn't, they believed the promiser, but they didn't believe the promised one. No, no, they rejected the promised one, and he was also the promiser. And so they've rejected him on both ends, which is the basis for why Jesus can say, you are children of your father, the devil, not Abraham. That's in John 8. 
eight or nine, eight. It's probably eight. But that, those, that interaction between Jesus and the Pharisees is very significant. It's about this promise and this covenant, and it's about their faith. And so what we're finding, what you, we see here is that you have to believe in the promiser, and you have to believe in the promised one. They're one and the same. So if you reject Jesus, you reject Jesus, uh, and ultimately the Father, right? Because Jesus didn't come up with these promises in a vacuum. The Father, Jesus is the one that delivers, right? But at the same time, when Jesus is delivering the promises, he speaks with all the authority of the Father. Um, and so they're, they're his promises as well. So, uh, he was willing to sacrifice Isaac. That's Abram, right? Um, Isaac is the promised child. We saw this in Genesis 22. I didn't have time for it last week. But if you look at Genesis 22, Abraham, he's about to sacrifice Isaac, and this is the promised one, right? This is the child that was promised. And so, um, right as he's about to do it, um, the angel of the Lord, Jesus again, stops him from doing so. But in Hebrews, it says that um, Abraham believed that God was able even to raise him from the dead. That's out of Hebrews 11. And that's why all who have faith like Abraham are his offspring. Um, and so, this is, this is interesting, but um, you have the promised child, Isaac, right? This is, this is the seed that Messiah is going to come through. Um, Abraham was willing to sacrifice him at the Lord's command because Abraham believed, well, he must be able to raise him from the dead. Interesting, the actual Messiah who's watching this um, is ultimately sacrificed and is raised from the dead. That whole scene of um, you know Abraham and Isaac and the sacrifice is incredibly prophetic. Um, it's all about Jesus and you see that Jesus is the one actually presiding over this event. That event actually took place on the, on the spot where the Temple Mount is today. Um, and so all of this is tied to that land as well. Alright, so um, the point of Eve and Abraham is this. They were, they were justified by their faith in the promiser, and they will be saved by calling on the name of the promised one, who happened to be the same person. And so Paul picks up on this in Romans, and chapter 10, he says this. He says, the word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. This is quoting the Deuteronomy 3. He says, that is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And these are the things that we believe in as New Testament believers. We know the name of the promised one now. We know that he's been crucified and raised from the dead. But he's going to equate that with the Old Testament promises and the show that faith is the same way. He says, for with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so what I want to establish here is that when we call on the name of the Lord, the promised one, Jesus, it is exactly the same as when Eve or Abraham called on the name of the Lord, Jesus, the promised one. They just didn't know his name, Jesus, at that point. But his name is Yahweh. <laughs> Even today, Jesus still bears the title of Yahweh. And so they believed in the same promised one. Uh, the same Savior that's to come. And then, of course, our faith, just like their faith, is based on the same promiser, right? And that's how we're justified. Um, Hebrews says, in chapter 9, uh, And just as it is appointed for a man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Um, I know this may seem kind of odd, but salvation is actually really, pre salvation, final salvation, is really presented in, in more of a future sense in the Bible, kind of because it's tied to the resurrection. Um, we'll talk about that a little more in a second. First, uh, just kind of tying into that, Paul says in Philippians, that by any means possible, I, Paul, may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this, or am already perfect, 
but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. And so the point here is that salvation isn't fully and finally complete until the resurrection. That is when we will be made perfect, and um, Jesus will actually save us. We think of him as Savior because he saved us from our sins when he died on the cross, right? And that's absolutely true. But he is Savior in a very real and physical sense because someday in the future, he's going to physically save us by raising us from the dead, saving us from the grave. Um, he's going to physically save the nation of Israel from its enemies um, and establish them in the land. And so... Um, Salvation is, is very much to come. I think that um, we have been justified by our faith, and that's really the language of the Bible in our present state that qualifies us for being saved in the end when, when Jesus appears. And so um, our habit of saying we, we've been saved or we got saved kind of in that past tense kind of way um, isn't maybe the most technically, biblically correct way of describing ourselves. I think it, it certainly um, expresses that we are in Christ, which is the point we're trying to get across. Um, and it definitely expresses our confidence that the Lord will return and, and fulfill those promises and ultimately save us. Um, so, we have the same promiser, the same faith, same covenant, the same promised one, we're all part of the same resurrection, and we're all going to be in the same kingdom. The theme here? <laughs> There's a lot, of, a lot of unity in this, both Jew and Gentile, right? Um, and this is going to be really important. I'm laying a lot of this foundation because I'm anticipating having to... Um, um, next week we're going to talk about amillennialism and some aspects of dispensationalism. And um, we're gonna we're gonna have some solid ground to stand on as we evaluate some of these these different systems and what they think about the future. So um, hang in there with me. <laughs> All right. Last couple of uh, uh, points here, um, and this is an important one: offspring of Eve or offspring of the serpent. Of, of the serpent. There are only two categories of people since creation until now. The righteous and the wicked. You're either one or the other, and there's really no in-between, right? The saved and the unsaved. Um, I mean, there's a lot of different labels that have been put over uh, the centuries, but the point is, is that um, you're either uh, attached to Jesus through these promises and faith, or you are not, okay? Um, analogies are intended to represent reality. If the analogy doesn't do a good job at representing the reality, then we just set that aside and focus on what we know to be true. Um, but some of the analogies um, to describe the group of the righteous are the body, one body, the body of Christ, right? The bride, the church, or the olive tree, um, which is one of the most significant ones out of Romans 11. In this sense, there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile. Um, this is how we understand the gospel at the individual level. God shows no partiality based on nationality or gender or anything else. Righteousness is just based on individual faith. But then we have this issue of Jew and Gentile. Okay, this, is a, this is not describing righteous and unrighteous. This is just describing a distinction in nationality. Okay? The gospel is also for corporate nations. Um, and what I mean by that is that there are promises made to the nation of Israel within the gospel that aren't made to the rest of the nations, i.e. the land, i.e. their specific king. Um, and so when a Jew is looking at the promises, um, and it's discussed in this book, Pursuing the Jewishness of the Gospel, it talks about Christians trying to present the gospel to Jewish people. Um, we tend to do it in a very individual way. Jesus died for your sins and you can be saved. But in the mind of the Jew, they're thinking about their people as a whole. They say, no, the Bible speaks of the entire nation of Israel being saved and the entire nation coming into these promises. Where is the corporate aspect of your gospel that's missing? Um, and so we realize that the gospel um, has specific promises for Israel that don't apply to the other nations. Yet all of the other nations will be represented in the kingdom. 
So God doesn't discriminate against who gets into the kingdom. In fact, he's going to gain a remnant from every nation on earth. Um, but the gospel of the kingdom must reach every people group. But that doesn't mean that we don't have national distinctions once we're in the kingdom. And so we see that Israel gets the promised land in the kingdom, right? They're going to get Jerusalem and, and, and those borders that are described um, back in Genesis. But the Gentiles will populate the rest of the earth, okay? And so um, this is a, I'll just reiterate this. The, the point is, is that, you know, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew, a Gentile, whatever, when it comes to faith, it's, it's whether or not you believe. You're either righteous or you're unrighteous. Once we're all in the kingdom, there are distinctions about nationality. Um, Jews get their piece of the world. You know, I'd imagine that the Irish probably get Ireland. You know, things like that, right? Um, but let's look at the picture of the kingdom, um, and we can kind of see where we're heading so we get a little perspective. Um, I kind of picture it like this. You have um, Jesus at the center here. And he's in uh, Jerusalem. And that's within the nation of Israel. And then you have the rest of the nations in the kingdom. And so this is this is kind of what the finished picture looks like, right? This is the goal. You have Jesus at the center, he's the king of everything. But he is still the king of the Jews. He'll take up his throne in Jerusalem within the nation of Israel, right? And so the gospel, just how, just like the gospel flowed out of Jerusalem and the Jewish people in the first century with the Jewish apostles, um, the blessings of the Jewish king and the kingdom are going to flow out of Jerusalem uh, to the rest of the nations around them. And so Israel, um, they have they have an irrevocable calling, right? Um, God has made them the instrument through which his blessings are going to flow to the rest of the earth. And even in their rejection of their own king, those blessings still flow to the rest of us. But ultimately, they're going to see him for who he is, and they're going to turn back to him, and it's going to be glorious. i read you a little bit out of Zechariah 14. Uh, then the Lord my God will come, and all the holy ones with him. This is at his return. That's right. verse 5. And the Lord will be king over all the earth. Verse 9. Then everyone who survives of all the nations that have come up against Jerusalem, talking about the Armageddon battle with the Antichrist, um, shall go up year after year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of booths. And if any of the families of the earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. Okay, so we see this picture in the end of Jesus sitting on the throne and the nations um, all subject to him flowing to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Booths. And we're going to have a whole week on the Jewish calendar and, and what that is. It's also known as the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, God dwelling with us is the idea of that feast. So here we have Jesus, God, dwelling on the earth, and the nations coming to celebrate and worship Him in person. Can you imagine the day that you're going to walk into Jerusalem, and you're going to see the King sitting on the throne, and you're going to get to worship Him in person, alongside people like Abraham, and David, or Hannah, or Eve? I think, I'm, I, I think after this week, the person I'm most excited to meet in the resurrection is Eve, the mother of us all. Um, she was the pinnacle of creation. She was the, the most important and most beautiful thing created, um, which is why Satan went after her. And I just think that, um, you know, the redemption of Eve and um, the vindication of her reputation uh, is going to be pretty phenomenal. I'd like to start that now, but um, I can't wait to meet her and see her one day. But we're, gonna, we're all going to be there. It's 
This is what makes eschatology exciting, right? This is why Paul says, in the midst of his struggles and his persecution and all the affliction, that, yeah, light and momentary, whatever. Like, I'm focused on the resurrection, that I might attain that resurrection from the dead because I see what's set before me, and I'm not going to let anything get in the way of that. No distractions. You're either with us or you're not. Um, get, out of your, get out of my way. Paul was actually trying to physically take the gospel to all the nations of the, of the world by himself. He was going to bring Jesus back once he reached the world with the gospel. I mean, that, that was his motive that he had in mind, um, which is pretty amazing. Uh, and then also in Isaiah, i got a second, I can read it. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 2. This is another really cool passage and just kind of a picture of the kingdom. Isaiah 2, starting in verse 2 through 5. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and shall be lifted up above the hills, and all the nations shall flow to it. And many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and, shall decide to, and he shall decide disputes for many peoples, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Next week we're going to talk about some circles of thought within Christianity that claim that Israel has no place in God's economy anymore. In fact, uh, God has finally and totally rejected Israel, and um, they no longer even have the promises. They don't pertain to them anymore. They've been transferred to a, a different group of people. And get into that. Attached to the New Covenant in Jeremiah 31, right after he promises the Israelites that um, ultimately they would become a righteous nation and he would put his spirit in them, um, he says... If the sun doesn't come up, then I will reject Israel. Basically, if the, the sun would have to stop shining before I'm going to reject Israel as a people. And this is in light of them being deported to Babylon, right? And so they're being deported for their disobedience. But in their deportation, he's promising that I'm not done with you. Even in your worst disobedience and your, your worst chastening, I'm not done with you. Your promises still hold. I'm still going to bring you back. I'm still going to fulfill this covenant to you. Um, even in the end, when we see the ultimate persecution of the Jewish people and, and Christians uh, under the Antichrist, um, when they're decimated, um, even then, God is still, ultimate goal is to regather them and to save them and to fulfill his promises. Um, and so, anyway. I just can't emphasize that one enough. So practical eschatology. What does, this, what does this mean for us here now? Uh, the gospel is to the Jew first. From our perspective, um, you know, if I've got ten people in the room that don't know about Jesus and one of them is Jewish, I'm going for him first or her. Right? This was Paul's approach. Um, the heart of the church should be in alignment with the heart of God and, and the Apostle Paul is a great example. He gave his life to bring the gospel to Gentiles. But in Romans 9, Paul says that he would forfeit his soul for the Jewish people. Paul's saying he would he'd rather be cursed for eternity if he could exchange him, he could exchange himself. Um, so that's how serious he was and he's just a man but I think the heart of God is, is in that and so uh, you know the, the Jewish people have to 
um, come into their calling. God is never going to abandon them. Uh, and so for us as Gentiles, if you look through that passage in Romans 11 about the, the olive tree, um, there's a stern warning in there for us not to be arrogant towards the natural branches, the, the Jewish believers within the church. Right? And, uh, and you'll see a lot about that if you pick up any one of those books at, at length. Um, but uh, Jesus will be king of the whole earth, but he is still foremost king of the Jews. And so what we need to do is, um, as believers today and now is to understand the gospel through the eyes of a Jewish person. And if you know anyone, we have, we have a few people in our congregation um, that are Jewish. Um, I would highly encourage you to seek them out and have a conversation with them and discuss these things and, and how the gospel pertains to them, particularly as Jews versus as Gentiles. Um, and then, uh, ultimately, uh, not a day should go by that we don't pray for the salvation of Jewish people and the nation of Israel itself. Um, because, again, our salvation is tied into their salvation. And so when Jesus told Abraham, those who bless you I will bless, and those who curse you I will curse, um, the church should absolutely be in a position of blessing <laughs> with Israel, right? Our salvation is not independent of them. Um, we cannot be arrogant towards them. And we're going to see that in that some of that anti-Semitic theology where they look at the Jewish people as cursed and, and disregarded by God, and yet they claim to be following the Jewish Messiah and King at the same time. And, we're gonna, I mean, and you might be wondering, what in the world do they do with all these passages about Israel coming into their promises, right? Well, yeah, they do. That's all that's next week. <laughs> Um, so next week we're going to look at understanding Israel and the church, how that all works, um, how we define these, these groups and their relationship to one another is foundational to how we will interpret everything ahead of us, which is why we're starting with this. I know these first couple of weeks are kind of thick with theology and, and some of these things. Um, we'll get into more interesting and fun things eventually, um, but we've got to start here. Um, and... Uh, because this is the dividing point for all these competing uh, schools of thought, um, whether it's premillennialism, amillennialism, dispensationalism, whatever, whatever group. Um, and it has implications for how we live right now, how we treat the nation of Israel, if we support it or not, how we treat Jewish people. Um, and then, uh, so next week we'll, we'll be looking at Revelation 20 a little bit, so we'll dive in there, um, and then we'll discuss all of those millennial isms. Um, so, we're out of time for session three. Thanks for hanging in there with me. Um, let me pray and we'll close our time. Father, thank you so much again just for the opportunity to be here to uh, study your great promises, to um, have so much faith in what you have promised to us, and have so much faith in the promised one. And uh, we just look forward to the day uh, when we can. Uh, see you face to face um, sitting on the throne and worship you in person uh, until then Lord I know we have a lot of work to do in carrying your gospel to the ends of the earth um, and to the Jew first and then the Gentile and so I pray that our heart would be in alignment with your heart that you would fill us with your spirit um, to empower us to accomplish these things uh, pray for your church to come into maturity and to come alongside Israel and that task as the days ahead get difficult for both of us. I pray for courage and strength and perseverance. Uh, we just thank you for your faithfulness and we have great confidence that you will finally and ultimately fulfill all of these promises and uh, resurrect us, translate us, and uh, bring us into your kingdom.